Record. We are now recording. This is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the final Global Information Literacy. Um, what are we calling these, Helen? What should we call them? These are really they're 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 just a conversation. We'll have a little bit of presentation. We've we've gotten pretty deep, and they've been really fun and informative and interesting. And I'm super glad that you're participating tonight, Howard and Laura and Helen again. And Stephanie, you're here. So I think Stephanie wants to play a listening role. But if it's okay, what we'll do is we'll get started. And Howard, do you want to kick us off? You're still muted, Howard. There we are. Okay. And you should be seeing the graphic on the screen with a lot of kids. Is that a fair assumption? Yes, good. All right. And you want me to go for how long? About five minutes? Yeah, five minutes is probably good. And then we'll, there's going to be plenty of time to dive deep again if there's more that you want to say. All right. So briefly, um, after doing a whole lot of work on, uh, with PBS on Where in the World is Carmen San Diego many years ago, um, <clears throat> I came back to kids after working in public media in other capacities and also um, uh, uh, running some companies and building some companies. And I decided that I wanted to travel the world and talk to kids. And what I found when I began in Uganda was that they were far more sophisticated, connected, knowledgeable, and all that than, uh, than I could have possibly imagined. Um, and that became a sort of a deep dive in which I run around the world and interview a lot of kids. And you see some of the faces here. These are from the interviews. <clears throat> you can look at a lot more if you want to go to any of the links. Um, but what I began to find was that they didn't necessarily believe what they heard in school, learned in school. They didn't necessarily believe what they learned on the internet. Um, and I don't either. I, and, and I'm a media guy. I used to write a syndicated column for the New York Times Syndicate for 100 papers. So I'm as much of a journalist as, as an author. Um, but the real telling part of it was when I worked early, early on in game shows, when we would write questions and fact check them against the Encyclopedia Britannica or World Book Encyclopedia or any of those. And we would keep a list of all the mistakes above each encyclopedia because it cost us money if we were wrong. So there were so many mistakes. These were notebooks filled with <clears throat> errors from all of the leading encyclopedias. And my wife later worked as an editor on, one of the, gold, on the Golden Book Encyclopedia, and she constantly rewrote many of the articles as the copy editor because the professor who had written the article had placed Brazil in Africa. So my confidence in the media in school, in the materials that we distribute is extremely low. Um, having been interviewed by any number of different newspaper reporters over the years and looking at my public relations person at the time and saying, was I in the room when she interviewed us? Because the story has nothing whatsoever to do with what we talked about. Um, so I think it's really good that we are skeptical now. I think it's really bad that we actually believe that media or school or similar um, is a, a singular uh, source of, of good information. It's a source of information. Things that are written on Friday afternoon and edited on a Friday afternoon are not going to be correct. And you know what? That's a, that's a tenth of the work that goes out of every house. Um, so I'm concerned when I see things like fake news. We've always had fake news. Newspapers are built on, on building subscriptions and, and selling circulation and all that. <clears throat> None of this is especially true, and a lot of it is based on mythology. So when I go into a classroom and we talk about Manifest Destiny, for example, I explain America participated in ethnic cleansing for profit. That's what we did. We built the railroads on top of a population. We are no better than anybody else. We're probably no worse than anybody else. Uh, but to call that nation building <clears throat> for all the popular reasons is the same as calling Christopher Columbus a hero. Uh, yeah, you can sort of make a case for it, but for the most part, it's not true. Um, but that's the mythology that we continue to feed. So I'm very concerned as we're now broadening to a globe 
of information, um, what kinds of information we're actually filling kids' heads with and, and how skeptical do we want them to be and how much do they have to rely upon themselves when, for example, the girl who is in the lower right of the graphic um, has diabetes, she weighs about 240 pounds, and there's absolutely no way for her to find out about any of that because she's not rich enough to go to a private doctor on a regular basis. Um, the school does not have a program, the grant funding went away. So anything she learns about diabetes, she learns on her own. And uh, we're raising a generation of people who don't have access to information they do need, but we're filling them with old curriculum based on things they don't necessarily need. And we've got this massive other tool that we've created in the internet so they can find things out on their own. I think we're very upside down on a lot of things. Um, and I think fake news ma it, it kind of parades in front of it saying, gee, we really have to do something about this. It's not the problem. So that's my opening shot. I'm hoping this will be a good, robust discussion. Oh my gosh, that's so good. So uh, let's pause for a second if we can. So how are the, the, I think there's a reason that Plato's cave continues to be an allegory that we really resonate with, right? Because we're narrative machines. Like we, we live off story. In fact, it, you could argue that evolutionarily we were built for story because story connects us in some way. And, and through that evolutionary, evolutionary process, there was no, there were no double blind studies. There was no scientific rigor or the scientific method. Right, so the, the ability to believe a story, I think is maybe inherently a part of us. Oh yeah. And, and if we're in this moment of the internet, which is comparable to the printing press, right, there's this massive shift in, in control over the narrative, which, which accompanies or is accompanied by shifts in power or, 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 or desires for power. So I think you've done a really good job of opening that conversation. Laura, would you like to go? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, let me just take a second to um, share my screen with you so you can see a couple slides. Um, let's see here. Hang on. Okay. So um, I'm coming to you. Um, this is my first time being engaged with the Global Ed Conference. I'm grateful to some of my colleagues who um, helped me to learn about it and introduced me to Steve. Um, I'm coming to this topic as someone who's a former um, middle school and high school um, social studies and English teacher, someone who's got a newly minted 13 year old at home who's beginning to come to consciousness and tune into to global issues in a new way. And also through my now professional role as program director at a global education nonprofit called Facing History and Ourselves. Um, some of you who are joining this webinar might have heard of Facing History. Um, the organization has been around for over 40 years uh, with a mission to help students engage with um, difficult moments in the past as a way of understanding what it takes to be an active citizen and someone who um, upholds democracy and human rights in our worlds today. Um, we've always made connections between history and the past. We've always asked questions about narrative, who tells the story, um, how do we understand what happened in the past, but this is um, work that feels a lot more urgent, I would say, lately in light of a lot of the trends that Howard described. And so I thought I would just spend a couple minutes um, both, you know, <laughs> appreciating the problem that has been laid out for us about, um, you know, in not only information, but also um, how we engage with the world at a time when um, we have so much access to stories from around the world, but perhaps not the um, knowledge and the skills and the dispositions to really um, have empathy and act around them. So I wanted to um, share a few, few resources, um, things that we've been developing at Facing History that might be some practical tools that um, could add to the thinking of some of the educators who are on this call. Um, for the last year or so, we have been developing a body of work around teaching about current events. Um, many of our educators are in the US, but we also work deeply in Canada, in the UK, South Africa, Colombia, Northern Ireland, Australia, many other places. So um, we're writing about issues all over the world. Um, and we're really trying to um, think about, you know, what do we as educators need to be able to um, help our students navigate this landscape of global issues? 
teams um, to be able to, um, to understand, to find information, to assess what they find. So I wanted to share just a couple thoughts from this checklist, um, which you can find on Facing History's website, and I'll, I'll put a link in the chat after. Um, and maybe they're informative in helping us navigate some of these difficulties that, that um, we face today. You know, when I talk to educators about teaching global issues, the, and, and you know, how much time do they spend? Do they think it's important? Everybody says they think it's really important to, to teach about contemporary global issues, but they also say it's really hard. And what they say is hard is having time in a really busy curriculum. And that's something that, you know, I think, um, you know, Steve and I were talking before about who feels responsible for teaching global issues and um, you know, who feels like they have a mandate to do it. So who has time, who feels like they has, have enough time to teach it? who feels like they have enough skill to teach it. And I think also this question that so many um, global events today, including um, climate and migration, things that affect everyone in the world, um, also in many contexts, including the US, spark a lot of um, partisan acrimony. And I think educators shy away for that reason. So we have this whole series of questions that we talk through with educators that really help them to sort of situate um, what are my goals? How will I choose what to address? Will I let my students choose? Um, will I bring issues to the class? I think importantly for, for what um, Howard outlined what are trusted news sources that represent a range of viewpoints. Um, and then, you know, not just how can we sort of find good information, but what are the skills that we need in order to have reflective and respectful discussions? Because even once you have some information that maybe you feel is um, pretty legitimate or you have, you know, a series of stories, um, being able to actually talk about those and make meaning from them is another thing. And then finally, you know, media literacy. How can I help students um, separate fact from fiction? So we have several strategies that, you know, I would recommend. Um, that help to navigate some of these difficulties. And um, what you see here is a little screen grab from our site where we sort of pair a bunch of different um, teaching strategies, discussion and critical thinking strategies with um, learning goals for students. So when you want to um, understand complexity um, and think about you know, root causes, something like an iceberg graphic organizer might be a really interesting thing to do. Uh, conversely, when you want to just process an emotionally difficult event, how do you use journaling? How do you use art or imagery or sort of open-ended strategies? Um, so I think, you know, when we are able to think as educators about um, not just the content that we want to discuss, but the, the way that we're going to do it pedagogically, I think that often makes um, this work more effective. And finally, I just wanted to share a little um, a, a little sort of insight into um, how we're trying to um, help educators talk about some specific um, issues of global concern. Um, so these are our polls from the page that we have been building. Um, and you can see we've got a few different kinds of content, including teaching ideas, which are short lesson plans, and then um, explainers, which go a little bit deeper into key terms and ideas that are important to understanding the news. One that I think is really relevant for this conversation is about global migration. Um, what are the, what's the meaning of the words um, refugee and asylum seeker? How many migrants are there today? What are the factors driving migration? Um, I think that's a really rich discussion. And then there's a collection of different teaching ideas um, that fall under these themes of um, global migration, democracy and civic engagement, including we just recently were, were writing about um, young people's activism around climate, which I think is such a powerful global, global story. Um, you know, our, because our work historically deals with um, difficult moments and moments when human rights were violated, this theme of hate, violence, and injustice is one that we think is really important to pursue and drawing attention to stories like the genocide of the Rohingya in Myanmar or um, persecution of Uyghurs in China. Um, so this is a place to find some support for teaching about some of those global human rights issues that can really um, engage young people today. And then finally, a lot of different media literacy strategies. So we just put a piece out about lateral reading, 
um, which I think really speaks to some of those um, sort of media information and misinformation concerns that, um, that Howard laid out for us at the start. So um, I have become really passionate about the importance of talking about contemporary global issues as um, a way to build students' sense of engaged citizenship. I think if kids don't understand what's happening in the world, um, they won't have an opportunity to act, to use their voice, to make a difference. So to me, this work is really important and I'm looking forward to hearing from the rest of you about what your approach is to. Thank you so much, Laura. So I'd like to kind of start us in a direction and see how this goes. So Howard talked about the way in which, uh, and I agree, youth seem to have a pretty good uh, skeptical filter. They've sort of grown up in an environment where a lot of those uh, narratives have been broken. And in some ways, over the last 10 years, it feels increasingly like the, you know, we know we're not being told the truth, right? That there's just, you know, you can't accumulate this much debt and then pretend you have a great economy. You know, there are all these sort of ways in which it feels like uh, whole industries are being sort of, uh, the, the whole thing with the Harvard sugar study, you know, sort of increasingly skeptical of institutions. So those kids arguably deserve adults who are good thinkers, right? So, so one of the things that I keep hearing from teachers is that they, they're concerned that, that there are children teaching children, that only a small percentage of the teachers are actually really competent in this area. And I say that very carefully because I'm just reporting what I've heard. But we heard this morning from Matt at IREX, who talked about a media literacy program he's doing in Ukraine. And then we had Marina, who's in Ukraine, respond and she said, it's a really good program, but the teachers don't really get it. The kids get it, but the teachers don't really get it. So if we, if we ask ourselves the question, what are we doing to, to be media literate? Could we kind of answer that question for ourselves? And I'd love to hear from Helen and Stephanie as well. Like one thing for me is I use a feed reader and I try and really read across a variety of viewpoints and across geographical viewpoints to be able to see how the same story is being told differently. What's something you do, Howard? Oh, you're still on mute. Um, I go to the gym and we're not allowed to change the channels because it's a small privately owned place. NBC is here. Usually ABC is here and ESPN is over there. I ignore ESPN. Almost every time when I'm there at 6.30, I think, the national news is on. But even the local news, not only is it the same story on both, it's the same visuals. They acquired the footage from the same places. It runs in the same order. They use the same fonts and the same color set for the lower thirds. Okay? It is exactly the same story. And part of, the, part of that is sometimes, sometimes it's in a different order. But I would say that of the, let's call it eight stories, seven stories a night, um, 35 stories a week, I would guess 32 of them are identical. So when we're talking about sources, um, I don't think we're seeing most of the world. You know, I'm, I have yet to find them talk about a Native American event that day, unless there was a major disaster. We miss most of what's important. We see some of it. We hear about some of it. But when I go into a school and ask them about United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, they look at me, they have no idea what the United Nations is, no less the SDGs. The teachers don't know. There is no world map in the room. There's no understanding. African-American girl I showed you before, she was one of a dozen kids I interviewed, all African-American, none of them could name a country in Africa. They weren't really sure whether Africa was a country, a city, or something else. That's where we're starting from. So when we talk about climate change and methane in Greenland, I'm like, methane's a cow fart joke. And Greenland might be an amusement park or a golf course. That's where we're starting from. It's no surprise that, you know, we're not making the kind of progress that we hoped we would. It's all great. We're all talking to each other. We have a lot more work to do. So how do you do that, Howard? Like you obviously have this really, this clarity of thinking in terms of your own perceptions. 
it's it's hard. We're we're social creatures. We're influenced by the people around us. We're also stuck with curriculum, and we're stuck with a format that we still believe in, and it serves a lot of good purposes. This school invention. It's a good invention. Unfortunately, the teacher in that classroom doesn't have the control over what's taught. So if that's not at the school level, and oftentimes it's not at the district level, and sometimes it's not even at the state level, right? So if we're dealing with a countrywide education developed essentially and managed by bureaucrats who don't spend a whole lot of time in classrooms and who don't do the kind of deep dives we do, we're getting what we pay for. This is what, our, this is what we decided to put in with our tax dollars. But there is an alternative course now. I think it's great that kids are learning from one another. I'm not worried about accuracy. They'll correct themselves along the way. Wikipedia was horrible at the beginning. The more people who get involved, the more activity there is, the better it gets. And it's better now than almost any encyclopedia that we used on the game shows, certainly. Um, I think that learning from one another is probably the way this goes. I think school has a gigantic reinvention to do. And I think big chunks of it have to go to social, emotional, and community work, because that's really where the problem is. We got a big mental illness problem, bigger than we do a geographic global education thing. We got 25% of college freshmen who are suffering from depression or have in the last year. That's a big, big problem. We need to deal with it. Do, do you think that, like my conclusion with the depression and the suicide statistics is that that's the kind of despair when you don't have a good mental model of the world, like if you, okay, I'm going to accumulate debt. I'm not going to get a good job. I'm going to work as a server. I'm going to be to, doing yeah. two or three jobs. It almost feels like that depression suicide statistic is a reflection of, a, of my generation, our generation, not doing a good job of preparing the world for them. Well, it's community, right? You can't make that scope too big. The scale of it begins in a household. This is what I'll talk about tomorrow um, <clears throat> during my session. But the essence of it is we ask kids now not to get their identity from their grandfather or grandmother. We ask them to figure it out on their own. And here's a whole lot of options. And by the way, you can see plenty of them on the internet. We don't really provide the family structures that we did in the same way. Lots and lots of kids, fewer families. We don't provide community because we all become wealthier. We don't rely upon one another. We have cars. We spend time away. We go to restaurants. We don't eat at home. We don't invite others to come to our homes. It's a different world, and we don't allow the kids to run around outside unguarded, right? So if you take those things away and a kid falls down, how does he figure out how to get up? There's nobody around him. So all of that are the big issues for me. And then school doesn't do what it has to do. And the kids are learning on their own. And then you have all this global stuff too. I think all of it is of one piece. And that's a lot of what I'm speaking about when I do public speaking at universities and, and all that. I think we need to think about this much more holistically. I'm sorry I'm taking up so much time. No, this is good. And Helen, you're going to have to be patient with us because I want to dive in this third. One more, one more piece and then we'll, I'm sorry, Laura, we'll get to you too. So, so Howard, the, the, you know, the conception of school, it, it goes back to Plato's Republic. Right. I mean, it's this, I mean, we talk about it as though it's a learning experience, but in large part, it's actually kind of an inculcation experience. Modern Western schooling is spread across the world, I believe, so efficiently because it's so effective as sort of a governance tool. But it's how countries kind of maintain, you know, it's how you get your population to, to work. And it was working in the factories originally. And now it's kind of, okay, we're training you for the job workplace and you're gonna you learn to obey and you learn to get things done well and you learn to get them done on time and etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. i'm not sure that schools have ever been except for the elite class have ever been really about learning and growing and thinking and now we have the internet and we have all these kids who have the capacity to learn independently can you really reshape education to become what was previously only for a select few oh yeah but it's everybody it's a different notion and that's the for me, that's the key to all of this. School was designed so that a lot of people, most people, would learn similar things, right? We would all have a base of knowledge that we all work from. We all learn algebra. We all learn all those subjects. <clears throat> that's not how kids think. It's never been how kids think. 
we're starting to respect that. It's, it has nothing to do with intrinsic motivation. It has to do with extrinsic motivation. It has to do with testing and all those other goofy things that we've invented. And kids learn because they're curious. That never changed. Now we've given them the tools to follow curiosity into projects or into their own little wormholes, whatever they are, and you know, have a good time. We need school to teach a certain base level to everybody. We can all argue about what that should be, but the most, for the most part, kids need to explore what they are interested in for short and long periods of time to figure out where they're going. And we need to provide ample um, support to do that. We need everybody to learn different things now. Before we needed everybody to learn the same things. Yeah, we all need to probably learn to read and write, although I think that's getting flaky, that argument now, because kids are using video more. It's more of a spoken word culture. We don't necessarily need that in the same way we did. I'm not saying it's not important, but I think it's fading. Um, just as math and calculators, like, uh, like spreadsheets, it's changing. And the kids are way ahead of it. And we're not. And that's a big problem because we're becoming irrelevant. So school becomes a social experience, which is fine. And it becomes a socialization experience, which is fine. But, it, but let's not make any mistake about it. The kids have already left you know, the system. They're not interested in doing what we're doing. And what we're doing is tremendously expensive and not terribly productive. And if it's about actually teaching sort of core capability, we're doing a terrible job. Well, I don't know that teaching is by concept a good idea. I think learning's a really good idea, but I don't think teaching is particularly great invention. Oh, I, I'm going to argue about that, but we'll do it later. Because I, I mean, I feel like the mentor, uh, the mentor mentee relationship is so critical. And I, would call that, I would call that teaching. And, and it's just that what we call teaching is not in my. Favorite. I want to learn from you. But if you tell me I want to teach you, I'm like, oh. awesome. Okay, so Laura, let's circle back. So your material looks really good. What do you do individually as an individual to help think clearly about all that's going on in the world right now? <laughs> you know, I don't know if anyone saw it in the, um, the New York Times Learning Network does this great thing where they engage young people in, you know, giving feedback about how they're reacting to various news stories. And they had this incredible graphic recently of someone whose head was just exploding <laughs> with this collage of newsprint and little smoke bombs going off. And, you know, I think there is that experience that adults and young people have in, in trying to understand what's happening. Um, you know, I, th I think for all the you know, doom and gloom that um, we are rightly discussing. There's amazing things going on like citizen journalism, um, including journalism by young people, which I think can, you know, give us, um, it certainly gives me different insights. Um, you know, people in my network who are sharing stories, including local stories from all over the world that are not being covered in the newspaper. Um, I'd like to look, I guess my more high tech version of, um, Howard's Gym is using something like All Sides, which is a really interesting um, website that aggregates news and shows it along a political spectrum. So you can look at how any given issue is being covered and they show you stories from the right, the left and the center as they have defined it. Um, and, you know, I just, I do, I do read laterally um, and I try to read really broadly from, you know, sources and languages that I, um, that I can speak, not only English, um, and just try to get a sense of, um, the stories that are being covered. But I think, you know, it's also, you know, I think trying to stay on top of everything is probably not possible and exhausting. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I also think that we need time to, to reflect and to kind of go deep into individual stories as much as um, we're trying to get that kind of broad scan. Yeah, it occurred to me that there were probably two things I'd add to my list. One is a journal. Right, and it seems like in a world that's so fast-paced that you, how would you have time to do that? But people who journal will tell you, I don't know that I could do what I do without journaling. Mm -hmm. I need the ability to think deeply for a period of time without being rushed. I need to, I, I actually have a favorite rule. I try and do one important thing a day. That's mm -hmm. my rule. So that way, you know, if I get two important things done, man, I'm really on a roll. But, you know, if I get one important thing done a day, I've gotten 365 important things done in a year. And it actually turns out to be very substantive 
And it helps to remind me that I don't need to be at that fast pace. I need to actually do things that are valuable and work. The other is, I'm still influenced by a book I read called How to Read a Book by Mortimer, Mortimer Adler. He was the uh, editor of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And he, and, and he wrote this book about how to read a book. And it was essentially you treat the book like a conversation. Mm. Like you wouldn't have a conversation with somebody else and they would just dump in hierarchical order all of that information to you. You get to ask questions, they answer back. And so you flip through the book, you find a chapter you're interested, you read it, you look at the index, you look at the table of contents, you try and get an understanding of what's the actual message of this book and how does the author get there. And I'm just realizing I kind of do that with news. Mm. It's like, okay, what's the ultimate message here and how do they get there and do I buy it? Right? When they say that this is an example of something, is it really an example of that? You know, or are they using a little bit of a cognitive trick to, to, to get me to agree with something? Or are they even thinking themselves in a way that may not be entirely healthy? Hmm. Okay, so Helen and Stephanie, did either of you want to add to this part of the conversation? Um, I, I, I'm picking up on the, some of the same themes with everybody. Uh, what I spend a lot of time doing is working with graduate teachers who are already in the practice. With PBS Teacher Line, we're focused on a course that is talking about information literacy. At Concordia, we're looking uh, deeply at media literacy. And at Grand Canyon University, we're, we're looking a lot at digital literacy. And what I'm hearing from teachers every day across the country and, and globally is they want to try these new things but at no other time in their teaching career have they bumped up against a scripted instruction model or an anti-teacher agency model. Um, when I was in the classroom, we were all encouraged to try new things, different approaches to reach every learner. And that to me has been one of the disappointments of the current time is at a time when kids have the resources to get to higher order thinking and critical thinking, we're trying to box in to where you, I have a teacher say to me, my principal told me he wants to walk down the hall and hear the same phrase from every classroom, the same dialogue. Teachers are actually given dialogue points. And it's kids, kids don't live there. Right. And uh, Clay Shirky has written poignantly about we used to be in a society where we edited everything and then we published it up. And now we're, thankfully, we're in a society where we can publish up and then edit together and collaborate together and add our voices together. And I think that's been, that's been one of the things that is a constant struggle no matter which platform I'm on, whether it's PBS or whether it's university or whether it's public school teachers who aren't continuing their education. And, and that's the tension that I see now. And perhaps we've gotten to that point because as a reaction to uh, so much media, people want to uh, tamp it down. But these are real issues that just aren't at one particular university, but they seem to be replicated across several um, areas. Thank you, Helen. Howard, so uh, Robert Epstein wrote a book called Teen 2.0. It's this massive tome. Of, it was a historical look at adolescence. Really? And he came to the conclusion that in most cultures historically, youth became adults at the age of 11 to 13. So as you went around and did these interviews, are, are we like way underestimating the capacity of our youth? And why? Who benefits from that? Why would we... Why would we not be engaging them at a higher level? You want to keep those teenagers down. They're a pain in the neck. They're outspoken. They smell, right? Um, I mean, teen, I mean all, you know, we've never really had an idea in the United States of what to do about teenagers once we stop forcing them to work, right? So by the 1940s, all right, so we can prepare them for war. We finish up with the war. And now we have this kind of high school concept that's starting to take shape and high school sports and 
if you don't quite fit in. So we're still struggling with that same question. And they drink and they try drugs and they do dangerous things. And now they've got cars because we have cars. We didn't have cars before. Teen driving wasn't a problem, right? So all of that accumulates over time. That's the, so, you know, they're adults. They're, why can't they vote at 16? We've made up all these rules. Well, the rules don't apply if the 16-year-old knows more than I do. And often they do because they're learning on their own. <laughs> You know, the school concept isn't keeping them down in the same way it used to. It's not as effective as it used to be. I think you've said something profound, right? Because we have, my wife and I have four children, right. and they're now 21 to 31. And um, it's really hard to be, it's, it's much harder to be a good parent than it is to be a bad parent. Oh, yeah. Meaning, and you really have to take the time. And, you know, there were moments when something, a class was really hard for a child, and I spent two or three hours a night helping them. And there's this level of finding ways for them to take responsibility, right? So knowing that, you know, having a job really helps them feel like they have a place in the world. And having, uh, you know, there are a lot of ways in which uh, not giving them responsibility hurts them, yep. but it's a little harder to give them responsibility. So in some ways, maybe it's a, you know, it's a, it, it's just that it's harder to do and we've, and we've lost the capacity or, or the initiative to, to really do that. I, I tried to hold a parenting course here in our local community and, and I called around to the churches and synagogues thinking that they would be really interested in, in hosting or having people come. And most of them told me, our parents are so busy working two or three jobs. They drop their kid off at daycare. They don't actually have time to think about this. And I thought, oh, that's tragic to me. Yeah. Because that's absolutely true. Everywhere. Gonna, everywhere. Yeah, and we're certainly seeing a, a demographic crash in terms of a lot of things related to family. And that's even a hard topic. If I talk to people who are here, I live in Asheville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. about the value of family. A lot of people will say the worst things in my life came from my family. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm like, okay, I get it. I really get it. And there's just something to me really important about the responsibility of parents to, to, to really help their kids. In fact, if I ask teachers what's the number one influence on a child's education, 99 out of 100 will say the family. Sure, but those are people who we educated using our education system. That's how you get Donald Trump to be president, right? I mean, it's just you educate people in a certain way. Those traditions and belief systems stay in place. Education doesn't erase them. Knowledge doesn't, you know, exceed over beliefs. Beliefs exceed over knowledge. So it doesn't matter. It's what the preacher says, not what the teacher says. Right, that's what counts. So we have this whole education system, but we haven't integrated it in beliefs and knowledge, except the beliefs that we decide to proffer, like Manifest Destiny. Like we, we really need to look carefully at what we're putting into kids' heads and how, how we expect them to process beliefs. Case in point, I wanna be a pilot. I'm in a Church of England school in, in Southport, England north of Liverpool, I'm sorry, south of Liverpool, north, no, I'm sorry, north of Liverpool. Um, but I'm in a Church of England school. So I asked the kid, where's heaven? And how do you process heaven among the altitudes and the clouds and the flight patterns you're learning about the atmosphere? And he's like, I have to look at it from a different brain. I can't use my same brain that I use in school to learn it. It's like, oh, so we have two brains. Well, not really. So why are you not learning? You're in a Church of England, Church of England school. You're talking about heaven? Absolutely. We talk about it in a religious education class. Like, how do you do that with science? He's like, yeah, we don't know. The teachers say different things. Not helpful. This is so interesting. Okay. This so is what I'm, and I'm not smart, understand. I'm simply repeating what I'm asking, what the kids are telling me. And they're telling me massively around the world, we are doing this wrong. They are so curious and so desirous of having a better system for learning. 
yeah. and they're finding it on the internet. So one of the things that I, we did with our kids that I think was brilliant was we always invited other adults over for dinner and then we didn't talk. Yeah, there you go. So we let our kids interact with other adults in a way that was more natural. We said, you know, th they need to actually have these interactions. We would invite their teachers over, just other people of interest. You know, that was really important to us. Yeah. yeah. I was going to go somewhere with that, but I've forgotten. Well, but so. that goes to community. It goes to parents don't raise kids. Communities raise kids. So because parents can't exert that kind of control and end up with normal kids. You need them to interact with lots of people in lots of circumstances of different ages, in different circumstances. They need to be bullied a little bit. Everybody needs to be bullied a little bit because you figure out how to fight against it. You develop resilience. You figure out who you are. You're bullied a lot. That's a different thing. But you can't go running back to mom all the time. Sometimes you've got to stand up or talk to a friend or cry or do whatever and figure out the next time we're, we're going to do this. Okay, good. That's called life. That's a good thing. Now, we get a little violent, it gets scary, but the concept of it goes back to what is a community's role. You need adults and kids, seniors, babies, everybody. They all take care of each other. We this need is to so be good. Dense and, yeah. So one of the things, Laura, that I really like are questions. Right? So when, when, when I want to engage a group of youth, I'll ask them, if you could reinvent school, what would you do? And I'm not kidding. Two hours later, oh, yeah. they're still, I mean, that somebody actually asked them. They, they have all of these ideas they want to know. So what questions do you like to ask? What are questions that you feel like really help people to, to see something important? You know, I think a lot of the best questions and the best ways to engage kids come from really understanding adolescent development and um, what the tasks are that kids are, you know, just fundamentally in their human development engaged in when they're 13, 14, 15 years old. And um, we know that one of the major tasks of that age is identity formation. And I think that, you know, all of the work that we do at Facing History is really rooted in beginning with conversations about what are the factors that shape your identity? If you had to depict your identity, you know, in a, in a sort of visual way, how would you do it? Um, is your identity something that is imposed upon you by your family? Is it something that you can choose yourself? What do you do when different aspects of your identity are um, in conflict with each other? Or are there times when people see you in a way that's different from the way that you see yourself? Um, these are things that, you know, I think that the questions that all kids are asking are, you know, who am I? Where do I belong? Um, do I matter? Can I make a difference? So I think when we meet them with, you know, asking about um, the, their, their lives, their perceptions of their community, their world today, when we invite their opinion, um, we know that, you know, kids at that age are really alert to issues of um, injustice and fairness. They're um, very concerned about hypocrisy. <laughs> And so I think questions that also invite them to look critically at their world are, um, you know, not only important in terms of developing their skills, but really resonate with um, what kids are sort of thinking and learning about um, at that particular age and stage. So um, I really think that kids are moral philosophers. And so I really enjoy, in addition to conversations about identity, conversations about ethics. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, those really... Um, you know, we've said a lot of things about the problem of the problems with schools. And of course, there are many problems. But one of the assets of schools is that um, they're a place where kids do come together across many lines of difference. They're a little microcosm of our societies and the incredible potential of school to be a place where kids can talk about things that matter with other people and learn to have those conversations. I think that that is um, perhaps not a promise that's always realized in school, but something that um, is essential and that doesn't require a complete overhaul of our education system for teachers to do. Okay, other thoughts. Is there a direction anybody would like to go with this? We've got about 10 minutes left. So I think the Stephanie that's in the room, I'm sorry she's, she's not on, but she, she, I think she just wanted to listen. She's doing a learning adventure. She took a year off, she's a little bit older been in the work world and and uh, just sort of in, did an, it took an intentional year off to kind of learn about things she was interested in and we did a series of conversations yesterday about gap years 
And one of the interesting things that came up on the gap year conversations was there is, there is an understanding of someone who takes a gap year or does a study abroad or a foreign exchange program that they're willingly going into something hard, right? They're, they're willingly going to go to do something where they're likely to encounter some difficulties. And in some ways, they want to feel capable of actually overcoming difficulties. And so there's, you know, there's a temptation. But they hear a lot of voices from people saying, no, don't do that because you'll get off track, you'll lose your place in university. And, and the counter response to that was, no, you'll do a better job of discovering who you are and what you want if you've taken some time. And then we had a really fascinating comment from someone who said, I'm afraid that if I take the time off, I won't want to go back to school. And so it was like, okay, so you don't trust your future self. It's like, okay, so you're afraid that you might make a decision in the future. Well, that's actually, do you trust yourself to be clear thinking? Or are you saying, I might get off track of other people's expectations? It was a brilliant set of conversations. Howard signaling. Yeah, I had to get the unmute. Um, I was recording interviews in a strange way, because the purpose of the interviews, this was in a New Jersey school, I had 30 kids in one classroom and next to it, I had one on one interview, which is the way I do the kids and the other, but we Skype from one to the other. So the kids could watch in the room of 30, what I was doing and how we put together a conversation. The teacher was trying to help kids understand how you ask questions. So it really had nothing to do with what I was doing it just happened that I was asking questions as part of a larger project. One of the kids in the larger room said, I can't stay here because it, this just, it's not part of what we do in school. And I have an important class that I'm missing in order to do this. I'm like, okay, what's the important class? He said, religions. I'm like, world, he's like, world religions. I'm like, cool. Tell me what you learned yesterday and what you thought you'd learn today. He said, well, yesterday we did Buddhism, Taoism, Taoism, and he named two others. I'm like, was this like an all day thing? He said, no, no, it was like, you know, 40 minutes. I'm like, so you did like eight minutes on Buddhism? Yeah. And today, well, we're going to miss, I'm like, wait a second. Let me tell you something about buddy. Go to the internet, read a few Wikipedia articles. You will be so much better off than spending eight minutes on Buddhism and then trying to jam four or five different other religions in your head during the same sit down. It's not, it's, a, it's stupid, I don't know how else to say it. Now I managed to say that with a superintendent of school standing next to me. And he looked at me, he said, you are so right in front of all the kids, hmm. right? They know it's, I, I have a friend who's a director of, of a new director of learning for a very large school district. And I say to him, listen, you have a choice. You can either protect your new job and try to play it till retirement or you can make a difference. He's like, I'll play for retirement, thanks. Very smart guy. I had a conversation with a superintendent. I gave a talk at a conference about my concern that there were large numbers of kids who were leaving school believing that they were not good learners and that they carry the emotional scars from this, that they don't know that school is a game. They think it's a judgment on their capacity as an individual. And so I said, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that only a small percentage of kids leave school actually really believing in their intellectual capacity. And he said, well, you know, the top 10% always rise to the top. And I thought, okay, that's a really interesting thing. You would probably would have to do that to, to be comfortable with a system in which that actually ended up being the case, right? You'd have to believe that, in fact, people are going to sort out. And we've gotten way off of the, the global literacy, right? But it, for me, it kind of comes down to the sense of every individual is uniquely valuable. I, I want to be really careful not to pass judgment on somebody, right? And maybe that's part of what we learned from global, our global experiences. Maybe that's part of what I learned living overseas for a year in high school or part of what I learned in other things is that I, you know, I, at core, I have to respect the individual capacity of every person and be respectful of that. And, may, you know, where does that come from? But that, that at least that's my core value. 
where it comes from is you understand that kids learn from curiosity and intrinsic motivation and you respect that. Unfortunately, you're working in a system that's organized in exactly the opposite way. But the heart of a good teacher always goes to curiosity first, not to curriculum. Sorry, let's do a wrap up. So Laura, any final thoughts, anything that you would want to highlight from what we've talked about or that you didn't get a chance to say? No, you know, it's a very interesting conversation. I, um, I'd love to hear, if, you know, I know we have some um, other participants listening. I, I wonder if there are practicing educators who are currently in the classroom who might like to share how they think about or approaching these problems. Um, you know, I think uh, from where I sit outside the classroom, um, you know, it's easy to uh, admire the problem and think about all the various, you know, dimensions that are challenging. Um, and I really always appreciate when I have the chance to also talk with practitioners about how they're approaching it. So that's, that's where I'd like to leave it. Thoughtful. And if, uh, if you're in the, uh, if you're a participant here and you want to leave a note in the chat, please feel free to do so. Uh, Helen, final thoughts? Uh I, I've appreciated listening and learning so much from all three of these sessions. One of the things I think that is so important as we talk about global literacy and larger audiences to solve problems, and one thing I ask my uh, teacher grad students to do is catch yourself failing and celebrate that as fast as you can, and then share that with your students in the classroom because a lot of students, uh, no matter what age, from K to 100, think that failure is somehow wrong and to be avoided, but that's how we get the inventions that solve the problems. Um, and that's how we grow and, and learn. So uh, that would just be my, my takeaway is, you know, what was your latest and greatest fail? And, and celebrate that. And I think with global audiences, uh, it, it's wonderful for kids to see that example and learn from it and learn together about it. I love that. And, and part, if, we, if we apply that to global literacy, right, there's a, or global information literacy, there's a degree to which I think my own kids appreciate my being transparent about my own intellectual journeys. Right. right? This is what I thought at this point in time, right? And now, now this is how I feel and this is why and I'm open to talking about it, but you know, I, f I feel differently about things now than I did five years ago. And there are certain topics that I've been thinking about for, for a couple of decades where I'd say, you know, I'm still grappling with this. I'm still trying to figure out how this works and what, you know, what I can do to actually contribute. Right. Metacognition is not microwavable. And Ooh, clever. I, <laughs> I, but I think they, I think they see the students in the classroom see the teacher and think that that's the finished product. And I think I'll never achieve that. E even a schlub teacher like me, when I came in with all, you know, pencils in my hair and everything, they still think that. So for me, it's important for teachers to tell their students, I'm in class too, just like you. I'm a learner too. And because I'm a learner and I know that I need two repetitions or 10 or 30, I'm going to do that for you. I'm not going to expect you to get it on the first thing. Uh, because I like for my teachers to listen to me, I'm going to listen to you. Because I failed at this, because I didn't spend enough time, or because of this, that, the other thing, I'm going to build that in for you. And, and I like, you know, I mean, it, it gets to be a confederacy, not of dunces, but of happy failures. And that's how we can learn better. Chris, I did a really interesting interview on my Future of Education interview series with a guy named John Rappaport who wrote a course on logic. And he sort of tracks the moment at which they stopped teaching logic in schools. But there's really good critical thinking material for educators. There's this, a whole series of books. And I, you know, I, you know, I think that's really important is understanding the ways in which you think about things and, and potentially even the cognitive traps that are easy to fall into. Um, okay, so Howard, final thoughts. Um. I, I remember I'm not a classroom teacher. I've never been a classroom teacher. I'm just visiting, right? <laughs> and thinking about it. But we make a black and white thing about failing and succeeding. 
And I just don't think it works that way. I think it's a spectrum. Um, one of the things I really love doing is wandering into a room where I know absolutely nothing and seeing if I can learn enough to actually get a sentence out and participate. I love the idea that I'm still learning 20 years later how to do watercolors. I'm not very good at it, but I can see that I'm making progress. It's not about succeeding or failing. It's not about a grade. It's about being in the arena. It's, it's about being a part of it. It's about gaining familiarity and deciding what you like and what you don't like to do. So I, the whole idea of this is polar in some way just makes no sense to me based upon the, the way that I, that I learn. And I don't think I learn that differently from the way other people learn. I mean, the stacks of books behind me on subjects that, I mean, what the heck am I doing in a positive psychology center at the University of Pennsylvania? I, 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 suddenly I'm able, and now I'm like, well, why don't we try playing this game? And all of a sudden there's a meeting of five people and another three people, and now there may be a million dollars on the line. Um, this is new for me. It's always, it's an adventure. That's what makes this great. It's what makes life great. It's what learning great. And somehow we decided school was the way to do it. I don't know. Certainly school helped a lot, but there's other ways to learn that are equally and sometimes more effective. Yeah, and, it's, and Laura's, Laura's nervous that we've been bashing schools, and I don't think that's necessarily the intent, but I think that some recognition of the, of the actual thinking that went into kind of mandatory public schooling helps to inform an understanding of what it, it was. The intent was open. It wasn't uh, hidden. You know, the, the desire was to get a group of people who would kind of become the engine of society and, and would be happy doing so. And I think there, you know, I think most of that intention was positive. Oh yeah. And, and then, so now we look at that and we say, okay, so this is really interesting to be at a period of time historically when information is so readily accessible outside of those school walls and is it reform? Is there a revolution? You know, what does human history tell us about moments like this where things change dramatically? Okay, so that was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to let you go. You got two minutes. There's another set of sessions. Thanks, Thank Laura. Thanks, Howard. Thanks, Bye, Helen. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye.